and welcome to Mums at the Table. I am Rachel and giving us some thoughts for a penny uh, today, <laughs> I've got Shona, I had to really think about how I said that. <laughs> Shona, Mary Ellen and Julie. Welcome ladies. Hi. Hi. Well in our conversations today we're going to be chatting about self-identity and what happens to it when you become a parent. And would you ask for Angela if you felt unsafe on a date? Is this initiative to address control over a date or partner going to work? We're also going to chat to suicide survivor Lauren Darlington. She's sharing her amazing story today and how we can actually support those who have mental illness. But first, despite all the talk and awareness in the media about women's safety, did you know that last year sexual assaults in the Sydney metropolitan region increased by 8%? Well, this has led police to take on an initiative started by Lincolnshire County Council in England in 2016. The Ask for Angela campaign is being rolled out in Metro Sydney area with the aim of improving women's safety in restaurants, pubs and clubs. Now, Mary Ellen, do you think this campaign has any chance of working here? Like, what did you think of it? Mm, um, look, I think I'm maybe a bit of a cynic. Now, I don't know how successful it's been in England. I probably should have looked that up. But I just can't help but think how trivial this is, how trivial a solution this is to such a ridiculously important issue. And it's just, it's so funny that the police, I mean, it's good that they're doing something. Don't get me wrong, but I think maybe, it's great that they're... Hold on, explain first what right, sorry. Ask Angela Yeah, is. yeah, so Ask Angela is basically you go to a club, maybe with a date that you haven't met before, and he starts being a little bit weird and you think, OK, I feel a bit uncomfortable, I need to get out of this situation. So you go to the bartender and you say, um, is Angela here or I'm Angela? Yeah. Or you mentioned the I'm word Angela. Angela. Yeah. And so the, the idea is that um, there's been training within pubs and clubs so that people know this code word and they can take you back and like call the police or just help you out. Or call a taxi. Or call a taxi. Or sort of discreetly or... disappear out the back. Why can't yeah. you just go up to the... the to them and say, I'm in trouble. That's what I thought. I, I was understand. like, why would you? Why do you yeah, well, that, ah, that's a valid that. question. Um, and I mean, the thing is, there's a lot more online sort of approach to dating now. So there's going to be a lot more people who put up a persona that they're not necessarily the, the reality. Yeah. 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 So when they get there, they find out it's something yeah. different. Mm. And I've read some really creepy stories. Um, and in England, they have had success stories where someone was actually physically trying to keep the date there by holding her hair. Wow. And she was able to go up to the bar and say, look, I'd like to ask for Angela. They discreetly took her out the back and she got a taxi and she was out of there. So it Is has it had some success. Being discreet? Yeah, but then there's other yeah. stories where <laughs> they've stalked her afterwards. Yes. And yeah. so, you know, I, I'm like you. I'm very... It's, it's a word. It's not going to stop the attackers. Most of us know now that if you're going to be raped or attacked or whatever, it's by somebody you know. Mm, yeah. So it's not going to stop that. This is, if you did this, it's only going to stop dating attacks or something yeah, like that. But I think they know it's not going to um, stop everything, but mm. at least it's an attempt. Well, that's the question. I, what are, we, what are they trying to address? It's, a, it's an attempt to stop that situation, I guess, or help in that situation. But yeah. why can't you just go to the bar and say, I'm in trouble? Mm. Well, obviously there must be times where people can't do that. There must be times where they're feeling so threatened. Mm. Maybe. But if everybody knows what Angela is, assuming that there's like That's posters right. up saying, you know, ask, because there is posters that yeah, people in the are toilets, putting, boys and men, yeah. uh, women and women, men's, yeah. Yeah, so I don't It, it, point, it seems honestly. as though it defeats the purpose exactly. of this, if they're marketing yeah, it. If the guy knows about it as much as the yeah. woman knows mm. about it. Yeah, put the money towards better security or pre-screening procedures before people come into clubs or, I don't know, like more police in the area or something. Mm. Don't waste it on making posters. What if there is an Angela behind the bar? <laughs> Yeah, then, then you hope she's useful. <laughs> well, that she knows about the system. Yeah. Well, look, they're trialling it here. I know New Zealand is watching intently because they're interested in trying it in some of their areas uh, because clearly there's a problem. Do you think by doing it this way, police are sort of, in a way, putting up their arms because they don't know what to do? Because if women don't think this is going to work, mm. why do the police? That's my mean. question. Because <laughs> they're men. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I guess it gives them some sort of credibility. Not not to say that, you know, what they're doing is just a facade or a face mm. or anything, but, yeah, look, I, it is a real problem. And I guess the question is, what are we actually fixing with this, with mm. this you know? Well, I mean, well. if it saves one woman and one life, is it worth it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, but it is. Again, why can't you just say you're well, in trouble or walk away? It's a start. Away? It's yeah. a start. Yeah. yeah. Look, hopefully, I know what I've read is that lots of bars and clubs and places in Sydney are actually training their staff to be more aware of this sort of thing. So that is a step in the right direction. Well, we're going to take you into a new segment now with Colette Smart. She's our resident psychologist. Have a look. 
I'm Laura Bennett. Every health fad has its time, but most of them sell themselves on being good for our well-being. Psychologist and parenting expert Colette Smart is with us. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. We do hear this term as well when, it, when we come to conversations around mental health. Can you elaborate on that? So essentially the term well-being comes out of the whole positive psychology movement. Sometimes the positive psychology movement is misunderstood. People think it's about happiness or making people happy. Now, I don't mean we want to make people sad, but really well-being is about human flourishing, mm. uh, about thriving even when we face adversity. So the World Health Organization talks about well-being in three categories. So it's our physical health, physical biological, our psychological health and our social Social health. Now, what I love is that uh, sometimes in the West we think we've invented things, but if you look back to traditional cultures like Maori cultures, African cultures and Aboriginal cultures, they've been talking about well-being for a very long time mm. and they've actually included spiritual well-being uh, to the structure of well-being. So they've had psychological, biological, social and spiritual well-being as being important to us um, being well mm. as human beings for centuries. So how does well-being relate to each of those different aspects then? So if we look at a biological perspective, that's anything to do with uh, our physical body. So are we eating healthily? Uh, are we ill? Um, do we have cancer at the moment? Uh, are we exercising to stay well? Anything that uh, affects us physically. And then from a psychological perspective, uh, we look at mental health, stress, anxiety, depression, being an optimistic person. Social well-being is obviously connection with others. Mm. Uh, there's a study I love to talk about. It's, it's a study that uh, has been going for about 75 years. It's still going. And really what they found is that what leads to happiness in people is not stuff and money and houses. Mm. It's human relationship. Yeah. What makes people happy is love. Mm. Uh, and then spiritual well-being answers the, the big questions of life. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Uh, a lot of faith-based cultures will look at spiritual well-being and say, yeah, we actually uh, believe we are worthy or we have mm. worth because we believe in something greater than ourselves. Yeah. So that's that aspect. It sort of sets up the framework for these conversations then. So if you've got one area within those few lacking, what is the effect of that then? So because it's an integrated system, one area affects the other areas. However, it's also encouraging and hopeful because when we are lacking in one area, say we become ill or we struggle with uh, anxiety or depression, we actually know that if we exercise or we eat well, we see the knock-on effect then on all the other areas. If we are out exercising, we often then interact with other people. When we interact with other people, we see enhanced uh, mental health. So each of them, we can actually tap into the strengths in each of those areas of our lives to actually buoy an area that we might be struggling in. Yeah, so there's always a way to find solution, which I yes. like. Colette, yeah. thank you. Thanks for having me. For more great advice from Colette, parenting tips and so much more, follow The Table TV on Instagram and also Facebook. Oh, very good. How do you enjoy that? Exercise, Shona. Exercise. Exercise. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> In our latest Mums at the Table magazine, Eliza Zoswislak, um, she set up long-term goals from early on in her life. Now, from finishing high school to going to uni to getting a job, a car, buying a house, having a family. Well, her list looked idyllic. And while she put a lot of thought into how she'd go and get her job, she does admit that she didn't put the same amount of effort into having what kids would look like for her. Well, Eliza talks about her change of identity and the challenges that that brought. Julie, I want to ask you... When you sort of had your kids, did you expect a change? Was it something you welcomed? Was it a role that you just sort of fell into and you're like, I was born for this? Or was it something <laughs> no, where you're like, oh, my goodness? Yeah, it was a bit more like that. I had my children in my early 30s, I think yeah. because I was a teacher and I kind of knew what I was getting in for. <laughs> as much as I love teaching, I knew that it was going to change everything. Mm. But I still don't think I um, really understood what the change was. I can... I really struggled with that identity change with the first yeah. baby, really struggled. And I can remember um, my first child was a terrible sleeper mm. and um, 
my husband going off to work in the morning and having been up all, what felt like all night and with this baby, crying baby in my arms and being in tears, she was about five months old, and saying to my husband, I can control 30 12-year-olds, mm -hmm. but I can't do anything with this three-month-old. And life just felt like totally out of control. I was used to saying, kids sit and they would sit and kids go and they would go and, you know, baby sleep and she didn't sleep. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really hard. It is hard. Yeah. Shona, did you feel like a loss of things when you came into motherhood? Like, a, I know there's a loss of sleep. I know that's obvious. <laughs> but a loss of anything else? Yeah, I think you do lose your identity. I've just been down and visited my my grandbaby mm -hmm. that I've just recently cool. acquired. <laughs> um, and I, I was watching um, my son's partner mm -hmm. and reminiscing on how much I had changed from being very much a um, person who was never going to have children. I was always going to work and never have children. And my children were sprung onto me, literally given by God, um, <laughs> whether I wanted them or not. Um, and yeah, just reflecting back on that, I did change a lot. I had to change mm. because you can't not change. Well, I guess, I mean, identity is something that you can change. People do it all the time. And I expect my identity to change again when my sort of kids move out and or get does. older. And that's <laughs> it does. Life is a continual change of yeah. identity. You know, like I'm doing the empty nester thing. Well, they're coming back and they're going, coming back. But, you know, that's a really big change of identity too. And I think you just have to roll with life and... Mm. And allow yeah. yourself to grieve a little bit. It's yeah. OK that life Thank changes. Yeah. Mm. It is nice yeah. to hear you sort of say the word grieve because I think I felt guilty mm. yeah. about that grieving process because mm. you're like, hang on, I... I can't sort of just do what I want. I've lost my career for, for a short time. It is for a phase. When I talk to people and say I'm a full-time mum, the conversation stops dead. And I just, yeah. all of a sudden, I felt like I wasn't valued. And for me, that's yeah. what really threw my identity. I think, I think the crucial thing is that identity and independence are so interlinked as concepts. Mm. And unless you can actually freely express who you are, you're not really anyone. And I think being at home with kids all the time, not being able to just, you know, go out to a movie with your husband or whatever it is, it really does stifle that, yeah. I, like, I think. <laughs> and, and look, yeah. I think what you yeah. say is true. Like, when you change careers, OK, that's one thing. But when you change to become a parent, like, that is mm. full-time all the time yeah. Yeah. You for the rest no of your life. You now are Rachel. No. You are... Rachel's children's mother. Yeah. Mm. You become you may, the mother. Yeah. You're and you may go back to work and you're a worker, but you're still mum. That's right. It never yep. leaves. Yep. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the thing. And sort of adjusting to that full-time change of identity and going, OK, where do I fit? I mean, I've met mums who just born for that role yeah. and the, all of a sudden, <laughs> once they become a mum, like, that's it, they become yeah. alive. And you sort of half feel guilty if you don't. And I have to confess, I did feel that, that guilt because I didn't feel alive. I'm like, this is hard. Yeah, when you don't have that maternal pull to yeah. be a, a mum and stay home and you have to do it yes. because nobody else is going to, or a dad who has yeah. to stay home, that's really hard because yeah. you have lost all of your yeah. identity. But yeah. Hmm. I love the idea, though, um, of building a village, and I wish I'd done that more as I was, an, like, early on in my motherhood. I wish I had built a village and had the, um, the nous and the bravery to ask for help. Yeah. Well, just know that all you mums are doing an amazing job and you have our support and love. Keep trooping on. We're taking you into the kitchen now. G and Olive are cooking a one-pot Mexican quinoa dish. Have a look. <laughs> This quinoa dish is so easy to make that you could just make a whole bunch or one pot and actually put it in containers for the whole week for your lunches. You can either use a pressure cooker, it's only two minutes in the pressure cooker to cook. If you don't have a pressure cooker, you can just use a pot, but you're just gonna have to check it a couple of times while you're cooking. So we've got one cup of quinoa. I've rinsed the quinoa, so you always have to rinse your quinoa just because it's got a bit of flavour otherwise. I like using the colourful, the like the three or four different coloured quinoa, which you can get at any supermarket, just because I like colourful dishes. And I use one can of black beans. Try to get the ones with no salt added, just the water. So one can of black beans. You can actually cook beans in the pressure cooker in like three or four minutes, You can, depending on what beans you're using. But if you are like me, you don't have time to do things, just get the cans. It's better to eat healthy and use cans than be eating stuff that's just highly processed. So I've got two cups of corn. Yum, you love corn. You said the other day you didn't like it, but I know how much you love it. Two cups of peas. You can use mixed greens or mixed veggies, anything you want in it. They're the ones that I chose to use. And it's only one 
one jar, this is a 400, I think it's 450 gram jar, but just one jar of any salsa. I like to check the ingredients. This has got the least ingredients and that's why I chose it. And it's got no oil in it. So I, I like to cook with less oil if I can. So, and here is all the magic. This is where the magic happens right now. One teaspoon of cumin, one teaspoon of paprika, one teaspoon of oregano, origani, which is called in Greek. I've got half a teaspoon of chili and one teaspoon of salt and two teaspoons of garlic powder. Now, you can use any seasoning you want, but these are the seasonings I like to use. It gives it so much nice flavour. It um, makes it taste Mexican, Mexican type style. And I just put a little bit of water inside, three quarters of a cup, three quarters of a cup of water, and then you mix it, and then you put the lid on our website, thetabletv.com. You are gonna find the recipe for this in the pressure cooker, and I've also given you the method for just the pot. But it's all in one pot. You don't have to dirty anything else. And then you put the lid on, and you let it cook. This is gonna take two minutes to actually cook, so it's only two minutes, it's awesome. I'm gonna set it up, and we'll see you when we get back. So, and then it's done. So then I'm just gonna let out the rest of the pressure. Things out. And it should be ready. Now, if you're doing it on the cooktop, like so on, on a stove top, um, you just do the same thing, whatever we've done, and then you bring it to the boil and then you simmer on low heat until it's finished. And I think it's around 20 minutes. So this is what it's looking like. How great is that? And we, thanks to our lovely Shona, have some awesome corn chips here so that you can serve it as a dish on the table if you're going somewhere or if people are coming over. You could just put this in containers, four or five containers, and you've got um, food for the week. There you go. So we've got our delicious one-pot quinoa. Try it. TheTableTV.com. Go to our recipe um, section there. Please join us again soon. Well, if you'd like more of these healthy but easy recipes, we're offering a free cookbook called Health and Happiness today. So just email us your name, your postal address and the name of this cookbook, Health and Happiness, to hello at thetabletv.com. And if you're in New Zealand or Australia, you can just give us a phone call. The numbers are on your screen. And don't forget this book is free, so you can take it. Well, today we're chatting to suicide survivor and Are You OK? ambassador Lauren Darlington. She's here today to share her story and how she came through it and what we can actually do to change the way we support mental illness. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It is lovely to have you here. We really want to hear about your story. So how did sort of mental illness come about for you? Yeah, sure. So for me, um, mental illness was... It was something I knew about a lot growing up. It was in my family and I was kind of told from a young age that it was just what to expect. Um, you know, it was in my family, it's hereditary, so it's just gonna happen. So from a young age, I kind of had it in my mind that that's, you know, that was gonna be my future. So for me, I know mental illness, or I knew mental illness quite intimately well. Um, from the age of about 14, I started self-harming um, and went through stages of that kind of on and off um, and then throughout my family my mum my mum's mum and like her mum had it as well um, and then I also had a cousin um, who really battled her own issues with um, self-harm and things as well so I knew mental illness really well um, yeah and had my own struggles uh, throughout teenage life as well, in and out of hospitals and, um, as you said, suicide survivor. So had my own attempts with suicide as well. So I know both sides of it. Yeah, did, yeah. did anyone sort of know that you were going through this from such an early age? Yeah, definitely. So my family were the first, my family were the first to know um, and then friends and things started to know because I've always been really open. Um, did you get any support from when you were young? Yeah, from... From when I started self-harming, there was a lot of support. Um, previous to that, there was support for different things, but it was never kind of um, on anyone's radar as something that was really urgent until the self-harm started. I think that that's kind of the biggest cry for help is when there's actually something physically happening, that that support really... Uh, so what really were the early up. signs that people missed? Um, 
I think for me it was it was definitely changes in how I was being. Like I'm a really bubbly and talkative person mm. um, and I would go very isolated, mm. um, wasn't very social. Um, yeah, would really retreat a lot. So they were probably the start, you know, the signs that didn't get, um, yeah, picked up. Were there any events in your life that sort of triggered mental illness in the first place or prolonged it or anything like that that, you know, we should kind of watch out for or anything? Or? Yeah, I think big life changes. Um, so growing up, you know, I had... I say the norm because I guess it is normal these days. My parents separated and then growing up with that, you know, changes in schools, changes in um, where I lived. Um, and then growing up, there was different traumas and things as well. So I think any big life change um, is definitely going to either prolong it or potentially bring it on as well. Mm. So you're ambassador of Are You OK? What does that look like for you? So I was really, I'm actually really excited because this is the first year that I'm a part of the um, organisation as an ambassador and I'm excited because it's their 10th year and as a part of that they've um, themed Are You OK Day as Every Day is Are You OK Day mm -hmm. and I That's love great. that. Mm. Yeah, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Which is great um, because I'm so passionate about having conversations and the actual impact that having a conversation and simply asking Are You OK can have. So it's as simple as that, just asking people Are You OK? Yeah, so Are You OK? have actually created like four steps and it's ask um, and then listen, encourage action and follow up. And the reason that I love that is because I think sometimes we don't ask the question because we're worried that if the answer's no, what do we say? Yeah. What do we what do? do, we do? Yeah. What do we do? Because yeah. then I'm kind of left going, oh, okay, like <laughs> how do I respond to that? Because <laughs> so, there still is a bit of a stigma around definitely. mental health and those sorts of things, isn't there? Yeah, definitely, which again is why... I am so passionate about being so open about things because I don't want there to be a stigma. Mm. When you're going through it, feeling like you're alone makes it um, even more traumatic and even more that there must be something wrong with me because I'm so alone in this. Mm. So I think by removing that stigma and making it that every day is Are You OK yeah. Day and it's normal. It's mm. totally normal to ask that. Um, it makes it I normal. love that because we often say to you, oh, hi, how are you? Yeah. Which is somewhat similar. Yeah. But are you OK oh, sort of is a bit more directed and specific, yes. isn't it? It's yeah. a slightly different meaning, doesn't it? It means yeah. we really want to know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If we've got a friend that we're concerned about, what's the best thing to do? Reminding... So for me... Um, and I'll share my experience because I feel like that helps. The best thing, like my best friend was um, one of the biggest kind of changing points for me. The best thing that she did was, I don't actually understand what you're going through, but I'm here for you. Like, mm. I'm, you're not alone in this. And I think if you're worried about someone, actually ask them. Um, don't be afraid and don't kind of beat around the bush. Like, actually say to them, I'm really worried about you. Are you OK? Um, and then if not, you know, when it comes to action, you don't have to have the answers, but remind them that they're not alone through it. Because I think that's the biggest thing. Like, no one wants to feel like they're alone. Yeah. And that can be really tricky too, because like you said, mm. you tend to isolate and mm. pull back yeah. and don't want to have to do deal with people. Mm. And yet your friend is going, are you OK? I, I can see that you're not. So it is actually a really hard dance to do, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. There were so many times where my best friend would actually just come and, like, she'd come over and just sit with me. We'd, we would not have to talk, not have to do anything, and she would just sit with me and we'd watch a movie or talk about something completely different, but it was knowing that I actually wasn't alone that was really, really comforting. Wow. Can I ask what some of the biggest mistakes that people made when they were supporting you? Was there anything that people mm. did you were just like, oh, that just makes me feel worse? <laughs> like... I've actually never been asked that and I really love that. I think anything that made me feel like there was something wrong or actually, yeah, there was a couple of things that I kind of almost felt like I was being punished um, or made wrong for self-harming because it wasn't really understood. Um, I mean, at the time when I was going through it, I was a teenage girl, so I was self-harming and, you know, of course there was a whole aspect of, like, bullying because of the self-harming as well. So I think the part that really... Yeah, the, the kind of, I guess, mistakes in a way were the making it feel wrong. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's really good to know because it can be so intimidating. Like when you know someone's struggling and you're not sure what to do, you don't want to do the wrong thing. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that's why people... Because I've done you it tend myself. You tend to do nothing. You tend to yeah. pull back yeah. afraid yeah. of doing the wrong thing, which yeah. is not helpful either. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I think even even with the mistakes, um, like at the, at the time they were so incredibly hard, but even the mistakes, like I look back now and I was like, wow, like there's a lot that 
even those most even those mistakes got me. You know, mm. they mm. I look can look back now and go, wow, like I've really got so much strength from those mistakes mm. as well. So I think people need to know that there's don't ever feel like there's something that you can do wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just reaching out and connecting. Just reaching you out means so win. much. Yeah. Yeah. So what does I guess what does life look for you now look like now that you've sort of come through on the other side? Like is, is life still as challenging as it used to be? I was going to say, tell me how yeah. you sort of experience life now. Yeah. Well, I'm human. <laughs> so yeah. I know we all are. Challenging. What? Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wake up one day and went, I'm still human. Um, so there's still hard times. Yeah. There's still hard times. And I think when you go in through it, you're like, when I come out of this, like, sometimes you can have this fantasy of, oh, I'm just going to be happy all the time and life will be great. It's not reality. Like, we're mm. humans. It's hard. Um, but... I am a completely different person and I look back on those times and I'm so grateful for them because I'm like, there is so much that I got from them and now life for me is I speak so openly about everything because I know it helps people mm. by being honest. Um, so, yeah, there's still challenge and, the, and there's still hard times but I know what really gets me through it now and in giving the hard times a voice and being able to speak about them and expressing them, that's really what keeps getting me through. Mm. You know, when I'm going through something hard now, um, I speak about it. Like, I, ha I know that it's okay to actually put my hand up and go, you know what, I don't feel okay today. Um, and that's totally fine. So Do you think you've been able to recognise it more in other people that are struggling that have tried to keep it quiet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. It, um... I noticed it, as I said, like I had um, with my cousin who was really struggling with it. Um, she ended up ending her life, but I saw the sign. Like I knew exactly what she was going through. Um, and unfortunately that wasn't, um, yeah, that, that wasn't enough in her own journey. Mm. But I was able to recognise that these are the signs and this is, um, yeah, this is what to look out for. So I think any changes in behaviour, like mm. if any, you know, any retreating or any, anything that's out of the ordinary for that person. What would you recommend if you are struggling and no one's asking you if you're okay? There's so the thing the best thing these days is there's actually so much support out there even if someone's not asking you know there's um there's phone lines like lifeline and things mm -hmm. like that where you don't even need to like you can be anonymous um there's so many resources online um I think social media is great because there's so many social media accounts that you can turn to for advice and things as well not advice but to have a look at um yeah like someone else opening up conversations as well so I think there's a lot available out there um, and I think knowing that it's actually okay to put your hand up and ask for help. Like, it takes so much strength. Mm, yeah. uh, you know, people think it's a weakness, but it takes so much strength mm, to go, actually, I'm not okay. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing. I think we, we see it as a weakness, but it's a strength. Yeah. It's a strength. Yeah. Important thing to remember. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Lauren, like, your, your story's amazing. We really appreciate you sharing it, because I know that... I know in Australia and New Zealand, nearly 50% of people are sort of going through a mental illness at any time, at one point in their life. And that's a huge number that's that we're crazy. talking about. Yeah. So thank you for taking the time to come in and share your story. Really appreciate it. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh. It's been great. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Always a pleasure with you. And don't forget, you can jump onto our social media, onto our Facebook. We love to hear your stories, what you have to say. We're here to support you as well. Don't forget that. We're all in this village together. We will see you next week. Have a great week. Bye. Ooh.